It's my pleasure to introduce again at this conference uh, a friend, a professional friend, uh, who's spoken many times in these conferences. Uh, it's a joy to welcome you, Sarah Armstrong Smith, Chief Security Advisor of Microsoft. And her presentation title is, We're Now Firmly in a Game of 24-7 Cat and Mouse Cyber Attacks. I'm not going to make any more introductory comments, Sarah. Thank great you. to see you here. Thanks, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really great to be here with you all today. So I'm going to be talking all about artificial intelligence and machine learning. And is it a friend or is it a foe? And I think you've all probably got your own opinion on that. But I really would just want to start with giving some background about where we are, how did we get to this point, where do we go next? So we have been in transformation for over 250 years. We've been on this journey, but the journey that we're on is accelerating at a pace that we've never seen before. So we go back over 250 years ago when we started to start to see steam power and how much that changed industry, how much it changed manufacturing. Then we started to introduce electricity. We started to see combustion engines. We started rail networks. and train networks and all of these different things combined. And then we had two world wars and not a lot happened in that time. So it wasn't until 1950 that we were on a massive build back. So we had to use industry and use industry at scale to bring all of this back together again. And we had the dawn of electronics and IT during that period. And in actual fact, uh, Microsoft itself was born in 1975. It's 47 years old this year. And at the time, Bill Gates had a vision. And his vision was that he wanted to put a PC in every home. Now, if you think about that, and you think about where we are now, we have surpassed that multiple times over. Um, an actual fact then, we could just accelerate even forward. And in 2016, the World Economic Forum said we have now in the fourth industrial revolution, which has been earmarked by digital. And what that means is the digital, the physical, and biological world all combining together. Now, there is a train of thought that we're already in the fifth industrial revolution, or we're heading into it, again, at very pace. Um, and that is the dawn of artificial intelligence and robotics coming together. And that's what I'm kind of here to talk about. What does that mean for us? Uh, and what does that mean for our jobs going forward? Well, the interesting thing is, we talk about artificial intelligence as if it's new. It isn't new. It's also been in an evolution. An actual fact, artificial intelligence was first talked about in 1950, where computer researchers um, were really thinking about this kind of what if. What if we had computers that were intelligent as humans? And it really got them kind of thinking about what would that look like? What would, how would the world change if we had intelligent machines that were just like humans? Now, it kind of got a little bit difficult, and they realized that, oh, well, we can't really do much with this. There's that kind of realization that to really think about this, we need huge amounts of computational power. And so the kind of like the investment disappeared, it didn't really go anywhere. And kind of where we are right now in the last sort of 10 years or so is we've really kind of pushed into the kind of the machine learning, the deep learning. We're starting to see this kind of the, the use of cloud and the technologies and how all a lot of these things are coming together. But I think it's worth really highlighting what is the difference? What are we trying to do? Um, what is the difference between AI and machine learning? And I think the real thing is that when we think about AI, and it's about that ability to mimic humans, and the reality is, as much as we're talking about artificial intelligence, um, we're not anywhere near true intelligence, true cognitive intelligence. So really what we're trying to do when we talk about AI is mimic humans as much as possible in their experiences, what they do, how they think, how they act. That is a one big thing that's missing right now from artificial intelligence, and that's the cognitive intelligence. It's what sets humans apart. It's your ability to feel emotions. And at the moment, when we're talking about AI machine learning, it's all logic. 
There is no emotion behind it. They do what they think is right, even though we can't make any sense of it. And it's the ability to, and that's the real key, is understanding the environment and being able to make decisions in the same way that a human can. Now, the interesting thing is, there is not a single computer on this planet, on a single supercomputer, even if you combined all clouds together, that can do what one human brain can do. And I think that's the reality that, you know, we can put as much computational power, we can keep doing these things, but we still cannot mimic a one brain. And I think that's really the challenge where we're going to, and that's why we're kind of, as much as we want to talk about AI in its, in its true sense, what we're really talking about is machine learning. And really what this is, is our ability to, again, to think like a human, to be able to analyze huge data sets in a way that would have taken humans weeks, months, years. And that is the challenge when we're talking about the exponential rise of data. How do you make sense of that data? And how are we going to start utilizing that kind of machine learning capability going forward? Now, we are automatically already seeing computer programs that are starting to write themselves. And the danger is we're also starting to see computers that are recoding themselves as well. And I think we're kind of getting into this, well, where, how far does this go? And again, there's it a logic behind it in terms of the, how the computer makes sense of the world, not how a human makes sense of the world. And that's kind of the, some of the challenges that we're faced with. And this is the challenge, really, is if we want computers to behave and act like humans, how is that really impacting on people? And what is the dangers? I mean, you can see there's so much benefit, but again, there is a lot of danger behind that. But automation is nothing new. We've had automation for a very long time. And we're starting to see the real benefits of this. And also with regards to the last couple of years where we've had the global pandemic, we started, a lot of companies are now thinking about Actually, things that would have taken weeks, months, years to do, we can accelerate at pace by utilizing machine learning, by utilizing automation. But what's the danger? What are we here? Do we think we're going to create jobs or are we going to eradicate jobs? So then we've kind of got this balance behind what does the future look like and how are we going to do this and how are we going to do it right? Are we literally going to be able to automate everything to such an extent that the humans aren't needed anymore um, or the humans still going to prevail? Well, again, if you look at this book, it was written in 1956. And it was talking about automation then. As I was sort of saying, this thing was being talked around. And I think this is kind of the danger when we think about what automation and robotics, where people are kind of scared that you're going to get these kind of big machines that are going to take over the world. And we've seen this in films. We've talked about Terminator. We've seen Skynet. We've got all of these things um, where the machines just run around with each other and, and they destroy humanity. But actually, the media itself has a real part to play in this, in terms of how they are scaremongering people. And there's just a couple of headlines with regards to, um, you know, just robotics are going to take over your life. They're going to take over your job. You're not even going to have a job. Um, and this is the kind of the worrying thing that people read these type of things, and they get turned off to technology. They say, why should we embrace this level of technology and capability if it's just going to take my job? What's the point? Um, but the reality is, is something quite different. And even when um, you know, Microsoft owns LinkedIn, so we have ability to get lots of information. Um, so this is just a look back over the last year. And it's looking at where the demand for skills is coming from. Um, now, you'll sort of see there's a 554% rise in, in robotics, machine learning, IoT, big data, and AI. So these skills are not going away. In fact, we desperately need a lot of these skills. But even if we think back to when the World Economic Forum was really talking about this fourth or fifth industrial revolution, what they said at the time was that by 2020, artificial intelligence and automation would have displaced over 5 million jobs. 
which is quite interesting because, again, if we look at some of the stats on, uh, on LinkedIn and other uh, communities and forums, um, we have six million open and unfilled jobs in cybersecurity alone. Um, so yes, we've got this kind of balance going on, um, but actually I don't see any evidence so far that any jobs are going. In fact, we, we have a big increase um, in requirements. So I'm going to talk and make this very specific to security um, and why we need the kind of the AA, the, the AI, the machine learning automation capability. And kind of where we are at the moment, and I'm being Microsoft, I'm a little bit biased and I'm talking about cloud, um, but um, we have seen a massive acceleration to the cloud in the last couple of years. So a lot of companies were already on their journey, they were already thinking about the, the cloud, but maybe they were a bit scared to dip their toes in. Um, and then we had the pandemic and everything changed. Um, and then we had the real requirement for collaboration tools like Teams, Zoom, and et cetera. Now, we saw two years of digital transformation in two months. Um, so the cloud isn't going away. It's accelerating to the cloud. But the reality is, as much as we talk about the cloud and a lot as we talk about this technology, many, many companies are still running legacy, and the legacy is not going to go away anytime soon. So the reality, what we're really talking about is hybrid. We're talking about cloud, we're talking about on-prem, we're talking about all of these things combined. The second thing that kind of happened over the, the pandemic, um, we started to see a huge increase in mobility. So we talked about hybrid working, but we saw a lot of companies that have relaxed their policies when it comes to bring your own device. So not only do people have a corporate device, they have, um, they have a work, uh, personal, they have multiples of them. Um, and this is really brought into question the kind of the trustworthiness um, of some of these devices. And, and, and again, it kind of brought security into the forefront. But again, we've started to see, well, much as we talk about cybersecurity, it's not just about IT. Um, so with these changing business models, and again, that kind of acceleration, we've got smart devices, smart buildings, smart cities. Um, and we've just started to see that the need to actually gain visibility between the IT, the OT, and all the uh, IoT combined is driving the need for that kind of eco-connected eco, eco systems and capability. And at the same time, we are in an incredibly hostile environment. Um, now, we've sort of seen as we go, that attack surface is growing exponentially. And again, even with pandemic, we saw surely in the middle of a pandemic, you wouldn't hit a hospital. They did, and they went to town on them. Um, and because anyone and everyone is a target, and that's the reality. In actual fact, we saw the worst cyber attack in history over the last two years, um, in which is SolarWinds. Now, we genuinely believe that SolarWinds is the most sophisticated attack we've ever seen. And we're starting to see more and more of that sophistication. And this is kind of what we're dealing with. And so when we think about human-operated attacks in particular, so we're talking about ransomware, we're talking about these type of attacks. From the attacker's perspective, their whole objective is to get on the network, and they don't care how they get on. So we've talked about phishing, we've talked about vulnerabilities, we've talked about social engineering, all of these things. Get a foothold on the network. What happens next is they then have to watch. They need to understand your level of security, they need to understand your capability, and they need to understand and know what your next move is going to be. And then it will tend to laterally move. So however they've got access into your environment, if they're starting from an on-prem or moving to the cloud, um, then they have to keep elevating their privileges. And then they have to decide what are they going to do. Are they going to exfiltrate data out are they going to encrypt the systems? How quickly are you going to be able to detect them? And then you have to act. Now, for most security operation centers, the time that we actually know about their, what they're doing and how they're doing it is when they've already pulled the plug. Um, we've had the ransomware demand. You've had all of these things, and it's too late. So we have to be able to bring these two points together and do it very, very quickly. 
So part of that is our ability to maximise our visibility. So this is about our being able to come across the IT, the OOT and the OT environments. It's those multi-cloud environments, multiple devices. And we need threat intelligence. And we need that multiple feeds and we need the diversity of those feeds. So we need the visibility first and foremost. The second point is we need to reduce the amount of manual effort which is currently being taken by security operations, network operations, um, and those people. And it's that automated detection and response which is really key to that. But it's also the ability to integrate all of the investigative tools, to do that active threat hunting, not to just sit around and wait um, for the attackers to do whatever they want to do in our network. We have to be able to fine-tune and pinpoint those anomalies, no matter how small they are and wherever they're coming from. And it's about maximising the human impact. Um, and it's un about understanding context and that continual learning. And I'm going to explain just how we do that in a Microsoft environment. Um, now, you might be familiar with some of the Microsoft technologies. Now I'm going to hazard a guess that every single person in this room is utilizing at least one Microsoft product right now, um, or your family is. Um, so you might be having a Windows operating system on your PC or your servers. Um, you might be utilizing link, uh, Xbox or your kids are. And I hazard a guess each one of you might have a LinkedIn profile. You may also be using Office 365 um, for your email and in your organizations or even if you're that way inclined, you may also be using Azure for some of your services. And on top of that, we have GitHub, um, which is utilized by millions of developers. We've got Bing, we've got search engines, we've got all of these things combined. So every single day, we collect, process, and analyze 43 trillion telemetry signals, which is being generated by every single one of those platforms. Now, just to put that into perspective, I joined Microsoft two and a half years ago. Now, at that time, it was 6.5 trillion. So, in two, just over two years, that has gone up seven times. Um, and then we're generating approximately 360 petabytes of telemetry data every day. Four petabytes of that end up going to our cyber detection and response um, capability. So, how do you make sense of 43 trillion signals. Well, funnily enough, we need huge amounts of machine learning and data analytics. And we're trying to understand context. Um, so we're looking for patterns, and we're looking for patterns of behavior. And we're looking what's new, what's different, how are those uh, cyber criminals and threat actors evolving? So as part of the threat intelligence that we have, this is first-party Microsoft intelligence. But we don't just rely on what we see in Microsoft. We also have third-party intelligence feeds as well um, to make sure that what we're seeing outside of the Microsoft environment, because quite rightly, our customers are running across multiple clouds, multiple applications, multiple services, running multiple technologies. So we need to combine all of that intelligence together. Now, because of the level of intelligence that we have, we are actively tracking approximately 250 different threat actors. Some of these are ransomware operators, nation state actors, and there's a subgroup that we call dev groups. Um, and these dev groups are either new campaigns, they're new threat actors, or where we can't 100% attribute to a specific group. And what we're trying to then do is look at their modus operandi. What do they do? How do they do it? What tools, technologies are they utilizing? Um, and we have a database um, of malware, which has got billions of malware strains in it. So we're con constantly comparing. Um, and so the, the, the threat actors themselves only need to fine tune and tweak any malware to try and get it through um, some of those signatures. And this is kind of what we're looking at. We're looking at the behavior analytics as the second point of that, looking at those patterns, malicious behaviors. And what we're trying to do is we talked about zero days. Zero days are still incredibly rare. 
What we really are looking for is just new campaigns. What, what are they doing? Are they attacking a specific sector? Are they protecting a particular country? Why are they doing it? How are they doing it? How is it getting past any of those controls? The kind of the third area is I'm looking for those norm anomaly detections, and we're looking for the smallest amount of anomalies. Something that just doesn't look right, something that normally would only take, uh, as this example here, is so remote desktop connections to a specific, it only takes five times a day, this is a hundred times a day. And then we put all of that together and we call it a fusion. And we've talked sometimes as well about the extended detection and response. And so we, look, we have a platform approach. You can't just look in isolation at what's going on in devices there, what's going on in this cloud here, what's going on in that environment. You have to look at it collectively across the entirety of that platform, across all those technologies. And this is how we utilize our machine learning and capability. Now, just to kind of put that into perspective, we're going to give you some numbers. So if we're looking at kind of the activity that we generate on a daily basis, when you're looking at identity, so every authentication, every time you log on, we get a signal from that. So we're looking at roughly about 300 billion um, authentication requests a day. Office 365 activity, that can be emails, it can be things going in and out, whatever that kind of be. You're talking about 500 billion. Um, and then with Azure, again, that can be authentication, it can be changes in resources, it can be various different things. You're talking about 320 billion. And then we're having to, like, we start fine tuning it, we're then looking for anomalies. So we bring that from billions to millions. Um, but that's still too much just to put all those millions of signals together. So we utilize that machine learning, the behavior analytics, the anomalies, and we're then trying to fine tune that down. And we're kind of running all of these statistics and analytics over it. And so you would go from billions of activities to actually just handfuls of cases. And this is how we are able to utilize machine learning and automation. And again, just to kind of put that into perspective, so our Cyber Defense and Operations Center, which is our sock of socks in essence, um, so we have different incident response for Azure, M365, uh, Xbox, all of them have their own different teams. But we collaborate all of those together into a fusion center. And we're trying to look, understand what's going across all of those. Now, if we were just relying on humans, um, this would, we would need a lot of people. An actual fact, I don't know if you can just read that number, that was from May. Um, in May, we had 69,000 security incidents. And this number's been going up exponentially. And a lot of this has come down to uh, Ukraine and the increased attacks that we've started seeing across uh, from Russia activity and others and other um, operators. And we only have two metrics in our SOC. And that is the time to detect and the time to respond. And that's about it, really. You can have as many metrics as you want. They come down to two. And our SLA is about 15 minutes. So if you're thinking, if you were to have an analyst sat there doing nothing, and their only job is to do tickets and close them every 15 minutes, we would need 2,000 analysts to, to go through that number of incidents. So actually, 90, over 90% 90 of all our incidents are closed through automation. Our analysts don't even see them. They're automatically blocked, they're automatically down. So it's the high fidelity signals, it's the things that don't look right, it's the new signals that go in front of analysts. And this is why automation, machine learning, is so critical in that environment. So here, we're here at the Future of Cyber Security Conference, so what does the future look like? So I'm just looking at the evolution and trajectory of SOX. So in terms of, again, from the attacker's perspective, when they're doing their observation, we need to increase that field of view. We need the intelligence, and we need to put that intelligence to work. Now, one of the things that we identified specifically as a result of the uh, Russian invasion on Ukraine 
Historically, when we're talking about nation-state actors, we would have shared that information with intelligence agencies and governments. What we've identified, we need to get this information in front of the people that actually matter, that actually have to make some decisions and strategic decisions, which is you. It's your companies. And that's the, this, it's about making that intelligence go to work. So in terms of that orientation, that ability for that attacker to sit in your network, to laterally move, to move around environments without being seen. We need that behavior analytics, we need that machine, and we need the human expertise that goes with that. And so their ability to decide means that we have to be able to know at the, mo the moment they are going to trigger some kind of action, and we need to respond quickly and dynamically with automation. And the, that kind of act really comes down to the speed. Speed is of the essence when it comes to orchestration and automation. But kind of where are we going next? Now, if you heard my last presentation, um, I was talking about the industrial metaverse. And we were really talking about this assistance that's needed. So if we agree that we're just going to see this exponential rise of incidents and issues, they're not going to go away, they're going to get worse. In actual fact, we're going to need the artificial intelligence behind us. And we're going to need the augmented reality. And what does that actually mean from a SOC perspective? It's your ability to visualize the whole network. As in, and what we'll be doing with that, um, and it, this sounds like a big belief, but it is actually real, um, is being able to have that augmented reality with the um, holographic images and those. Now, this is real as well. This picture is not real. This is actually generated by an AI, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> But the, the really, the thing is, the HoloLens is one of the things that Microsoft actually owns. And it's one of the things that we're developing. And it's going it's to bring that whole security operations to, to life. In terms of, again, your ability to visualize all of the network, all of those capabilities together for you to understand context and for you to make those decisions. So I'm just going to end, um, really, with and our ability going forward is about being able to put machines to work to shorten that observation, to, to make better decisions, but really get in, in terms of that analyst. And actually, when I talk to our own SOC, one of the things that they said, if you're looking at skills, people that are needed, we do not need more analysts. What we need is data scientists. That is the thing that we need. We need people who can read and study all of that data, the machine learning. What's it telling us? What do we need to change at the back end? And where, why are we getting all these vulnerabilities? Why are we getting all of these alerts? And that's kind of the key, really, in terms of how we're going to move forward. Um, but I'm going to leave it there. I don't know where I am on time. So <laughs> do we have, am I over time, on time? Swat on, there you go. Um, so, so, so thank you very much. Um, I am going to be around in the break if you want to come and talk to me. And John and I are going to be back at four uh, to meet with Karen. Yeah. So thank you very much.